Reddy Show. We are switching our debate day and bringing you the realty debate at the start of the week because of a big development which has the potential to alter the course of real estate sector in the country. Securities and Exchange Board of India or SEBI has cleared the rules for property-backed investment vehicles known popularly as REITs to be listed on Indian exchanges. This move comes as the much-needed breather for commercial real estate in the country which has been depressed for some years now, a result of weak demand and slow economy. Today on the show, we look at the status of commercial office assets across the country and get the expert panel to forecast demand, supply, rental trends and quality of assets, all with the purpose of arriving at the one big answer we are seeking. Will REITs be a winning proposition for all in India, including investors, not just developers? Let's welcome Mirfan Razak, CMD Prestige Group and past president Kridai. Also Sanjay Dutt, Executive Managing Director, South Asia, Kushman and Wakefield, India. From Mumbai, Sunil Rohakale, MD and CEO, ASK Group. With me here in the Delhi studio, from the right, Amit Grover, National Director, Offices, DLF. Paris Singh, Co-Founder and Senior Managing Director, Redford Capital. Vishal Kumar, Managing Director, Xander Finance. Gentlemen, thank you very much for joining me. And today, look at the panel, two of, two of the biggest landlords in office space in the country, DLF and Prestige, represented on the show. And so are the two PE funds who have the ambition of bringing REITs in the country. So let me start with Parry Singh, rare or actually the first time we've been able to drag him on the show simply because of REITs. So look at the SEBI rules, uh, Mr. Singh, and tell us, does this now give you the indication that between Singapore, Hong Kong and India, three markets that you were considering, you will go with REITs in India first? I think it's a very first point, a lovely development. It's much needed. The first deal that Redford did in India was an office development alongside with their fan of prestige in 2004. Mm -hmm. um, the buildings taken are, you know, as time takes in India. It's a seven year pregnancy in India, usually to build a building, sometimes eight. Mm -hmm. um, and now we have a park with a fan that's almost two and a half million square feet, just that building. Uh, we have a pretty nice um, collection of assets outside of that. Mm -hmm. Now, there's a lot of things that make a REIT very successful in a country. Obviously, REIT is basically a tax. Um, it's a taxation status, really. It's a tax passed through. And we've been waiting for it for a long time. I think clarity is awaited, uh, but it's much needed. It'll help drive the demand for commercial assets. It takes a long time to build a great commercial asset and to lease it. Mm -hmm. And one of the things that we, we are hoping to see is how the lease tenancies change as a result of this development. Uh, but we're Will excited. Uh, we've been fussy from day one. We look for longer tenor of leases. Um, you'll see that as, a, as every asset that I've been involved, or we've been involved in as an investor. We've always looked for lease terms over a smaller lease term period. So we haven't done typical leases, but they were designed for REITs. All right. Um, so remember, you know, Redford is an institutional only investor. So we we run several, you know, more than several billion dollars. Uh, we have a lot of commercial real estate. We don't really talk about the amount and size. Um. We need you more often on the show to start talking <laughs> about them. <laughs> but okay, so overall you're pleased and you think, again, you've not answered that one big question. So now India first, right? Because I you've declared your ambition to choose either of those three markets. Absolutely. I would say that the liquidity, um, it'd be great if there's a, we need a lot of developments. It needs real estate equity analysts to come aboard, which we haven't seen yet. Mm -hmm. Obviously, there's a lot of following for uh, what Amit's going to talk about, for, for example, for bigger public companies that exist. But there's public equity analysts needed in real estate REIT space, which we don't have as yet today. Uh, between the choices of uh, countries you narrowed out, I mean, India, Singapore, and hell, I mean, you could think even outside of that. Uh, and I would say people have done this already in Singapore and they have done well and let's just say questionably because India is not considered Asia for Singapore, for example. Maybe it is, maybe it's not. Uh, okay. Sometimes I've gone to Singapore and they think of India as a part of Europe. I mean, I'm just joking. <laughs> Okay, it that's could the be. I'm hearing that, but all right. So, so I'm still not getting a straight answer, but okay, we are assuming that it has to be India. Amit Grover, a lot of excitement, uh, you know, years of struggling to try to get back to the same rental yields as you saw in 2008, and the market hasn't even climbed back. Long tenure, uh, you know, tenancies, all of that. How are you viewing this development for from a 
from your asset point of view, you have a basket of 28 million, which everybody is saying is probably the first beneficiary of this development. What do you see? So with 400 million square feet of grade A space today, with out of which 200 million square feet is, I would call it a triple A space, which is ready for to be transferred to the REITs today. What's also the point is that the maturity of the market has come pretty much of the age. In today, most of the tenancies is with, with very mature captive multinationals. Mm -hmm. Out of the 500, top 500, Fortune 500 companies, 150 have already opened up captive centers in India. Another 100 has to go in the next two years. Okay. Now look at it from the tenancy which you're creating, which is very much similar to your long-term te tenancy for US markets. Right. And then at the same time, the value proposition which the buildings have graduated, you know, and the whole asset class which is developed in its own maturity. So today, the tenants are talking about high value infrastructure in the, along these buildings, safety, security, you know, a complete ecosystem development engagement. So in true sense, the both from a REIT as a developed assets as well as the expectation of the customer have made the whole asset class move to a much much more matured position. You really think so? Y you think there is enough good quality assets to make uh, not just one or two initial star REITs which list and after that the quality of assets starts dipping. What do you think Vishal? No, I, th I think that, uh, I think that uh, companies like DLF and uh, Parry and, and firms like us or you know Prestige have have over the last uh, eight odd years if I'm not mistaken developed about 330 million square feet of grade A assets which is a which is a good enough bulk to start with uh, and um, and and this development will probably prompt uh, developers to improve further improve the quality of their buildings because at the end of, at the end, end end of the day the better the building the better the valuation the easy its ability to get into a reach structure um, and 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 the better the rent growth and capital appreciation over a period of time so it's going to it's going to result in a in a in a gradation of quality of assets and okay. uh, and and the good and the good boys will be separated from the bad in a matter of few years how many good boys are there <laughs> no, seriously, I mean, so if question. I look at the list of beneficiaries and uh, from the report, GLL report, it says DLF 28 million square feet, Prestige 8 million square feet, there's Phoenix Mill 6 million square feet, Blackstone 22 million square feet. Feet. Who would believe that you know you would have uh, Blackstone becoming the one of the largest landlords right uh, after DLF maybe of this country? You have Brookfield at 15 million square feet, K Raheja Group at 15 million as well, Embassy Group at 15 million, and then of course there are combined assets of Embassy and Brookfield and RMZ Group at 13 million square feet. So, you know, if if I look at the figures, uh, I mean they look really really large. Your own portfolio is very large, but how quickly and how soon will you be able to move them into a restructure and what are the some of the compulsions that you might face uh, before you actually do so? Well actually uh, the initial uh, moves and uh, the RBI are welcome but I think there is a path still to go on the detailing on the tax structure. Hmm. First is the initial capital gain exemption and moving the entire portfolio to the company. Right. And then obviously there are larger areas around a larger portion of the REITs portfolio is still with the SEC. So what is the MAT treatment? within the SEZ will be one area and then the still, dividend. Still issues which are fairly tangled, uh, Vishal? Yeah, lot, lots of uh, lots of clarifications mm -hmm. needed. Stamp duty, income tax, capital gain tax, yes. uh, uh, some things on withholding tax, the balance income tax in the hands of the resident uh, unit holder. So, it's lot of, lots of clarification needed. I think it will come over the next six months. More importantly, uh, more importantly the everybody still has to guess or at least uh, get their minds on pricing. Mm -hmm. There's still a lot of gap between what developers uh, or sellers, sorry, in this case expect, expect and what buyers, investors such as us or, you know, retail investors expect. And that gap is going to be measured and filled over a period of, I guess, at least maybe a year, a year and a half. And it's going to take some time before we see the first uh, impact, real impact real of, impact. of this development. Okay, Mr. Razak, SEBI's rules for REITs. Uh, have they met all the expectations? In Bangalore, we spoke about it. We said hugely positive development and a week later, we are actually saying, all right, the rules are out. What do you think, sir? Hey, the rules are out. I think uh, it's in line of what we were thinking, except a few more things like stamp duty and a little bit more on taxation that needs to be clarified. Mm -hmm. I think, but we are more or less getting there and that's a good one. Uh, but it's an, it's again, 
it's an opportunity. Or how big is it an opportunity no, for 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 you? I mean, so you know, Parry was Mr. Parry Singh was talking about the first uh, office space he developed with you in 2004. As it's maturing now, it's been a seven to eight period, and how perfect the time is for REITs uh, in this country. Would you agree with that, or do you? I mean, other than the taxation issues and all the cost of transactions involved. Yeah, I think that. Well, if you look at the timing perspective, I think it should be perfect for Parry. I heard him talk <laughs> and I think he must be feeling really top of the world just now. Uh, because he was even thinking of uh, listing it not in India if REITs hadn't come maybe somewhere else. Uh -huh. But it's good that it's happened here because then the entire opportunity happens for India. The money stays in India, more money comes into India. It also affords an opportunity for the small retail investors to invest into REITs. Mm -hmm. All right. We'll Actually, come to Actually, believe you me, our company, we also... Mm, Go ahead, sir. Running a REIT, so unstructured REITs, mm, <laughs> where we sell undivided uh, space to our investors and then we, we manage the property for them. We lease it, sublease it, all of that stuff. But I think this is a big opportunity for the smaller retail investors. Absolutely, except that that kind of business does very well in uh, South India, sir, where, where, you know, developers like you are dependable in North India. Those kind of unstructured businesses are fraught with risk for investors. Sanjay Dat, various estimates have put the grade A office stock at approximately 375 million square feet, out of which about 80 to 100 million may be up for REIT listing. And I'm going to keep adding the figures because I want you to corroborate whether this figure is right or not. This could generate cumulative rentals of 60 billion rupees with a potential capital value of 600 to 70, 750 billion. My God, these look really mouth-watering. How accurate are these? So, I think the figures that you early, earlier mentioned about the portfolio size of key large developers in the country was accurate. Mm -hmm. And given the, the new size of the REIT listing that the government is now thinking, you can certainly add about 20, 30 more developers contributing mm. uh, cumulatively close to about 10 to 15 million square feet across the country. Okay. Uh, so that's where it is. I doubt whether it will be 600, 700 billion, but I think uh, eventually once you do office REIT listings uh, and once the confidence picks up, the market behaves properly, the regulatory is clear, uh, the, the retail investor uh, gets tax-free income, and, and there is a clarity around uh, the whole subject in totality, you will see shopping centers, you will see many other opportunities, and of course the 40 million square feet that keeps getting built every year will start coming into the same kitty. So eventually, it's a large game, uh, but may not necessarily on immediate basis, except for these uh, the few developers and, and the large private equity firms, funds who have built a portfolio in the country. All right, so which one do you think, Sanjay? Because I know the developers will not say it, uh, neither will the PE funds. But do you think Embassy Blackstone will, will be the first ones to be off the block? I think uh, wherever you have uh, a fund like Blackstone, they would like to wait for full clarity on the regulation. Mm -hmm. uh, so unless you have everything uh, spelled out by the government clearly, yes, they would be ready to list whether they are the first one or the last one or the second one to list. I think the local developers who got their act together, they've been you know, very keen to offload this portfolio, would perhaps be the first one to go. Uh, local, well-established office development who actually have asset management portfolio practice, you know, like Irfan was saying, they've already been managing these uh, for a very long time. So they would have much more confidence to go first uh, than the second and third. But if the regulatory is completely clear, you know, it could be anybody. All right. Sunil Rohakale, I have not come to you simply because you have a totally residential portfolio. Are you wishing that you had an office portfolio and you, would have, you perhaps should have taken that step some years ago? I think uh, India is largely development-oriented real estate country mm -hmm. uh, rather than income-yielding uh, assets country. And I only thank God that these kind of regulations have only come in uh, 
post maybe uh, global crisis and not really ahead because I feel okay. in commercial real estate is very fragmented market. A lot of experiments have been done by the developers, by the investors into this asset class. Whether one need to lease it out, whether one need to do a strata sale, one need to really do uh, an office building, one need to do an IT building. So I think there was a, enough confusion in that market. And if you really look at the uh, the whole segregation of the uh, the spread of this asset class, it is all concentrated in few cities like Bangalore and Mumbai and Delhi. And you can name few hand counted developers in say maybe Pune and and maybe Chennai could be there. So I think I'm not at all unhappy about not getting into the commercial real estate in the past because it saved solid labor and I think we uh, rode the ride of uh, the residential development which anyway which is in line with uh, Mr. Modi's uh, uh, 2022 housing for all but mm -hmm. going forward this is a very significant asset class so I think uh, it was a one lane where it was only one entry and there was no way to come back and I think the lane is now open for the other side as well so I think uh, this will help definitely unlocking the value of the asset, some of the balance sheet which probably got, uh, uh, these assets got stuck there, some of the banks who are sitting on these assets will release a lot of money to real estate. I think overall I am feeling very good about uh, this development of uh, REITs in India. Alright, I, I know that I, I must take a break but there is a really important question. Paris Singh come in here, you know we keep talking about the fact on how distressed balance sheets are going to get repaired with REITs coming in and guess what, as capital gets released and as uh, capacity gets released we are going to start seeing a construction boom all over again. Hyperbole, little real, li little bit of reality or no reality at all? Well, I'd say what's good for our country. Mm -hmm. You see, uh, if you look at our economy, we're getting a lot more growth in our service business. Service business needs real estate. Real estate, commercial real estate, residential real estate. And we're getting a lot of urbanization, both of which need a lot of commercial real estate. I think it's really good. Now, the example I gave with we Prestige, Irfan and us, we built the project together. It's taken us eight years to develop a nice commercial asset of two million plus square feet. It takes that long to do okay. in India. Not saying it's faster, but to build and yield and get to a point, it's like a long tenor. The baby's pregnancy is long. So now the question is, what's the cost of money mm -hmm. while, you, while you're pregnant? You can't really afford to afford that much of an interest rate. Now that would come down if the leverage ratios were to change, which is what happens in the rest of the world. Leverage ratios are much higher. You can borrow more and the loans are a little bit more flexible. We haven't seen that in the country. I think we're looking forward to that development and guess with great partners. We had a great partner with Prestige and we love them. Um, we had a lot of financial stability to bring into uh, projects and especially with a private equity firm like Redford. We did bring that in, but we need the market to mature and we're looking forward to that. Um, but I think uh, it's a great opportunity for REITs to come in because it's going to release a lot of equity and leverage into this market. Now REITs so it are will twofold. Release capital. I mean if you're saying leverage it will, what do you think? Yeah, I, I think the... But will, the it, will it help prepare balance sheets of let's say a company like TLF very quickly? How long will it take is the big question. The, the whole regulation at least from a tax front has been designed Hmm. to deleverage balance sheets. Right. I don't think that anybody actually the if you read the if you read the text of the tax pass through carefully, if you do not have leverage in your books, you actually will be probably undervalued than an asset which has a lot of leverage. Mm -hmm. But it's very uh, important to note that we have hybrid REITs coming in India. So they're not just equity REITs, they're mortgage they're not just mortgage REITs, hybrid REITs. If you, the regulation basically is already opened up to yeah. both things. Debt okay. leverage mortgage which is debt. Right. and equity. This is getting a wee bit complicated for for the investor or anybody who is looking for that answer. If I have 2 lakh rupees and now that REITs will be opened up for me to invest in, does it have potential to give me the returns that I'm looking at? I mean, does it have the potential to beat inflation and become a better hedge against inflation than gold? Remember, that's a asset class that Indians are just absolutely fond of. So we have to look at REITs versus gold. We know that it should and hopefully do better than bank fixed deposits in terms of giving you regular income and also perhaps some capital appreciation. So we'll come back and look at some of those factors critical to make REITs a success for investors.
Our big debate today is on REITs. Uh, SEBI has cleared the regulation for real estate investment trusts in India. If you have 2 lakhs to invest in, you can actually look at real estate. Remember, there was a time that anything less than 25 to 30 lakhs, short of buying a house or a small commercial space, there were very few openings for real estate investments. So, the ticket size 2 lakhs still makes you a high net worth investor, but it's really not that high either. Will REITs offer attractive risk-adjusted returns to investors? Well, most people are pegging the returns at 7 to 8% for REITs versus 8.9% for India GSEC. But, and we say that rentals need to appreciate at least 4 to 5% annually along with rise in capital values to become an attracted investment option. Amit Grover, is that correct? Is that math right? Yeah, absolutely. So I think the, the, the math is very clear that it's... it's uh, the REITs have to give better returns and mm -hmm. I think the biggest long-term beneficiary... And be more tax efficient, and the two things. Exactly, and biggest long-term beneficiary can always be the retail investor, which mm -hmm. at least in the current North India format is investing in commercial property in a, in a strata sale format. According to me, that is a lose-lose position because on one side, the occupier who has to take a space needs a larger space and the owner has a smaller space right. and then you land up accumulating and then there are pains in the system. What is more important is that the REIT brings in the culture of asset management, mm -hmm. right? Because in the strata sales building, when it comes to refurbishment and reinvesting in the building after every 10 years, who would do that, right? right. So then that is linked to the value creation and the returns on the rentals. I mean, I'll give you a converse example. Something like in Cyber City, we have been investing in an existing business district. We invested in the safety around the buildings. We invested in the fire station. We got a, a five-star rating from the British Safety Council. We right. got LEED certification. As a result, while rest of the market was static, there is a 20% increase in the Cyber City area in the last one and a half year. Now imagine, oh absolutely, okay. which is, which is quite a trend, <laughs> yeah, yeah, absolutely. <laughs> and it's purely because of the value creation. I mean, Cyber Hub was created just as an engagement for the end user. You still need to sort out the parking issues, exactly. but my <laughs> point very well taken. Okay, uh, uh, Sushil Rohakale, just, uh, would you agree with the point that now for retail investors, why go in and buy a house between 25, 75 lakhs uh, or even go up to a crore and a half. That's only a capital appreciation game. Now look at REITs very carefully. I mean, we've had a whole, uh, whole host of investors running away from the capital markets, from stocks because they haven't done too well on that front, on equity front. REITs, can we hope for better? I think in India, uh, we need to really understand the Indian psyche, whenever they invest into Indian real estate, the returns expectations are always an equity returns. And I haven't came across anybody who is really talking about a debt return. Because whatever they have seen little in their life cycle is always a, a game of capital gains, uh, the capital appreciation, the capital values appreciating than the rental yields, whether it is a residential or it is commercial. But a very few handful of people have tasted this asset class in the past. So I think uh, it is not really going to be, it is all depend on what kind of investor appetite you have. Uh, you have. Uh, the investors which are probably conservative investors probably will evaluate the option of investing into REIT vis-a-vis -vis GSEC, vis-a-vis -vis FMPs or vis-a-vis -vis a debt instrument, but uh, investor who is a savvy investor, who is a seasoned investor, probably he probably uh, may not really allocate large part of the capital to uh, read, but uh, as a standard portfolio allocation, he will have. Uh, so I think it is a lot of customer education is very required while we are talking about read as an uh, asset class for people at large. Okay. So I think so it is a not a very general statement. All right, Sunil. So uh, that's that's a very well made point, Sanjay. That. What do you think? What will, do you think that at least for the first two years, you don't even have to market it to retail investors, just stick with institutional investors and now of course SEBI rules also allow for foreign investors and pension funds to come in. So that should pretty much be the target investor. Uh, so while there is a flexibility, but I don't think that will be the uh, situation. Mm -hmm. I think foreign uh, investors will still be careful uh, for time being. Yes, they are certain institutional investors, whether domestic entities or foreign entities who may start exploring and start putting some capital into REITs. But I think it's the local investors who are expected to participate more 
uh, because they've seen it. This is the first time in real estate they, where they will be guaranteed some return in a way when you look at the portfolio, when you know there is income coming, there is a rent visible, there's a property visible to you and there's no uncertainty of development or when the development will happen, when the possession of the residential apartment will be given to you and what will be the capital appreciation which is all you know, you know, marred with risk of marketability and, and future dynamics. So I think from that point of view there would be an appetite in the local market space who would go for this okay. and it will probably improve the overall perception of uh, you know development companies because this would be a lot more transparent. All right, Mr. Razak, you said that you know already in an uh, unstructured form uh, there has been real estate investment trust, uh, not the trust, but real, est real estate investments and commercial assets that you you have been floating for investors in Bangalore. Tell us what kind of returns have they got used to? So will this seven to eight percent be good enough for them? I think, uh, see, apart from the return that they get, that seven to eight percent. They also look at value growth in so the, capital in the terms of is there is still a important, real estate sir. growth, capital appreciation. It is, it is because it has a combination of both that makes the investment attractive. And I believe even a REIT also will give the same sort of a return mm -hmm. because if you're looking at the 7 to 8 percent return or maybe even whatever uh, uh, number that we list at, apart from you getting the, uh, the dividend you also uh, have listed this uh, uh, your, the, there's a price which the market determines based on the value of the asset and future uh, growth on the rent and everything else so it's, it's entirely like a stock market so the you see it's just not the return that you get determines the value of the stock it's the overall picture that will determine the value of the stock and i believe that whoever invests will look for an appreciation but it also can be the flip side uh, your your value can depreciate if right. supposing there is some suddenly something goes wrong and there's high vacancy level that can even happen in in uh, when you're also an individual holder in a property but the only great part in this is that somebody if they want to man, uh, money quickly they want to exit there's it's very very liquid you don't have to worry about paying property tax. You don't have to worry about, uh, you know, paying certain money for maintenance and other things. Supposing the property is vacant. So this gets taken care of by the REIT, by the manager itself. So I believe that future is, after this REIT legislation has happened, most of the large commercial real estate development will be done on a REIT structure because it, it's it's going to change the entire dynamics of how commercial real estate is built and developed all these years we were doing a mix and match of both we were doing a bit of strata sales and then managing it for our clients plus we were also holding property with uh, with my pe friends like uh, Paris singh who have invested with us and uh, created wealth so it's uh, today i believe that the future is when any large development happens in commercial real estate it's going to be with the eye uh, on on uh, the reach structure and uh, that's going to also change the quality of development it's going to change the entire dynamics of uh, how these are managed and uh, uh, built so i think that's big one and i must commend the government for having that vision to bring this legislation all right, so positive, uh, of course, inputs from everybody just in terms of what it will do to commercial space in the country, the quality of it, the liquidity, the leveraging capabilities that it will give to developers who seem to be borrowing at very, very high prices, even if it's a private equity fund coming in, it's coming in with very, very stiff terms. But again, coming back to that one big question, does it make for good investments? Look at commercial property prices. They have declined by 14% between 2007 to end 2013. So we're going to come back and look at what is the outlook for commercial and office space. Largest occupier is the IT sector. NASCOM says IT sector will employ around 10 million people by 2020. That's the rate of growth of approximately 20% annually for the next seven years. So what's the story there? Because ultimately, it's how well the office space does, rental yields do, is how well REITs will do in this country. Back in a moment. Will REITs be 
for investors in India. So I'm going to toss this question to Vishal here next to me. Vishal, I wanted to know that basic answer. REITs, inflation hedged, better product than gold or not? Um. I think over the long run, they're definitely a better product than gold. Uh, mm -hmm. I'm not What's sure. long run? This long run is a really, really nebulous period. Uh, I think you would look. You would have to look at a four to four to seven year horizon. Okay. Okay. Uh, definitely better, uh, 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 better than gold in terms of risk or return. I'm. I. But the return at the end of the day. I think 80% of the return is going to depend upon the entry price right now. What happens in the next one year, and uh, and if and if the sellers look at this as a short-term opportunity to just get the best valuation, then I'm afraid that the retail investors or any investor for that matter is going to suffer. Whereas if they take a more longer-term view, uh, then I think everybody would be happier in the happier in the long run. But I think the most important point, which uh, at some point of time everybody will realize. That it's not just about uh, just about measuring the return as as it is. You got to reads reads are all about management at the end of, at, at the end of the day. The management team has to run with those assets, grow the portfolio, or decrease the portfolio over a five to seven to ten year horizon. And if they are not able to do that, then over a period of time you will lose value. Are they good enough managers, Pani Singh? Do you think they will emerge, or will there be a learning so. period and there will be a lot of pain points as the mutual fund industry went through? Huge amount of pain points before Even the it private matured. equity yeah, business in India uh, in real estate. Thing. So, yeah. for example, we've learned that you know you got to you, to make returns in India. You got to you got to work really really hard. You got to work the assets really hard. Mm -hmm. Get rent growth going. Get better better tenants. Get better leases. Get better lease terms. Make changes in the assets, and then that's how you make returns. And uh, and I think the managers, whoever the managers are, including people like us. See, if you look at the real estate industry and the private equity, the first seven eight years, I think there were eighty funds they were down to like a handful left mm -hmm. after a decade and we don't want that to happen to REITs which basically it's very important so good quality and credibility of institutional investors who bring those things to life and market will action great REITs which I think is going to be important comparing gold which is a commodity to real estate g commodities are naturally hedged for inflation right most for the most part gold is real estate is hedged as well for inflation in India real estate rentals Look at, if, you, if you look at Irfan prestigious portfolio, 5% annual bumps by and large. Or not so for NCR yeah, and good count. It's no, not general. No, it's not general. You're absolutely right. Now, other parts of the world, you actually have inflation hedged uh, real estate. Good so, provide in, inflation hedging becomes very important. Uh, over time, we might see this here because we don't know what inflation rates are going to be in India. Mm. But over time, I think real estate provides, like if you're given a choice between gold, real estate and government bonds, I would take gold and real estate. Gold and real estate, no government bonds. All right. So, will the sellers be reasonable in the pricing of the assets? Well, actually, it will be. Uh, do you think this is the right time to milk it? <laughs> Beginning, my portfolio is the most mouth-watering. Yeah, Why not yeah. go for it? <laughs> what we really more focus is that how do you create, as rightly said, these are long-term investment. How do you create that valuation? How do you create that value for the buyer? Which is, for according to me, the. You know, I mean, to be very honest, real estate companies now have to really do a lot to bring win back the trust. Absolutely. Look at the stocks. Look at the kind of expansion they've done. I mean, look at the market caps where they were and where they are now. And the biggest fear, I think, all of us as investors will have is will they try start with good quality a grade assets and then start farming off bad quality assets how do you prevent this i mean no, the, the, you have to there are there are great points i was just giving an example of tlf 30 million square feet now we've got our british safety council certification which has got a five star rating on safety big differentiator dupont as a safety consultant imagine for a developer having dupont as a safety consultant Companies going for gold lead certification. We've got 15 million square feet gold lead certified. And you will price it right. I mean, exactly. You will price no, it right. No. I, okay, I'm going to take that <laughs> because that's the only way investors will make money. So you you have you don't have a quality issue, but pricing is going to be an issue here. Uh, Sanjay, that what are your expectations? And you know, my big concern, and most investors have this big concern. How do you trust these developers? this time around <laughs> of course the managers will be great but even mutual fund managers buy the stocks which are available in the country isn't it at the end of it no it is true and and uh, don't want to take this away from the developers i think we have some of the finest developers in the country who have worked under extreme conditions to build quality asset but the reality is that the asset management has been the weakest area of their uh, you know core activity uh, I'm not generalizing for everybody, but I think overall, as an industry, and we witness that every day as property managers for various developers. 
we don't see all the developers committed towards delivering a, a work environment to an occupier where they can enhance productivity, reduce the energy cost, reduce the overall efficiency of the property. In fact, maintenance charges have been going up in the country consistently. In some places, they're almost closing because the rentals have been suppressed in many markets. Mm. In fact, maintenance cost is becoming higher uh, than the usual uh, percentage that you would expect. So it is a big concern, and I think majority of developers are not really geared up. Okay. I think even consultants like us who have been practicing property management uh, and, and so far the mandate has been to keep the cost under check will now have to reposition to deliver better quality experience, more safety, more higher standards, more environment and overall creating a value so that the occupier pays a premium for this development right. and therefore your uh, commitment to the investor who's put in money into the REIT they see their you know yields going up and they see the value of the asset going up so okay. i think all that is set for a radical change also there are some technical issues you see we normally charge in india rent for the premises that we lease but there's so many other charges there is a ht power which gets converted into lt power right. and there is a delta between the two kind of electricity that you transfer then you have maintenance cost and there's a management fee on the maintenance cost. Now what should be the benchmark for the management fee that the developer is charging for the maintenance cost over and above the actual cost? And what are the uh, system checks and balances or the efficiency standard that you're building? All of those, okay. each of these developers so, are so practicing their own... Uh, Alright, so redefining the game, raising the bar extremely high for developers themselves. Irfan Razak, a final word from you. I mean, uh, there is excitement around the office space, REITs are open for retail, uh, hospitality, but in the investment trust, infrastructure investment trust, uh, does that uh, give you some kind of uh, excitement on the retail assets that you have as well? Because those have been the toughest to actually get in investors, isn't it? Because the exits are very poor, have been very poor. Yeah, yeah. So, so this is the big game changer. Apart from office space, now we can pool in retail assets into a REIT. Uh, the two retail assets uh, were the most expensive to create. Of course, the returns from retail assets are much higher. Uh, but you see, if I had a PE fund investing into my company on a retail, into the SPV, into a retail asset, unfortunately, they could not exit because uh, a ready property, a ready retail property, uh, 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 the PE fund or another PE fund couldn't buy. So you had to find a, uh, the domestic buyer for it. So that made the exit that much more difficult for a PE who's invested in a retail asset. Now with REITs opening up uh, and allowing retail assets to be pulled in, there's a big exit route even for PE funds who have invested into retail assets. And I believe that again is a game changer. Again, you may see a spurt in the activity of creating good quality retail assets. Right. And of course, the game, name of the game is good management. Uh, without good management, you can't get good value. And you brought out another point, Manisha, is as valuations, we are, while we work out valuations, we have to curb our greed. Mm -hmm. We have to see that, look, there has to be a balance between when we do the pricing, it has to be balanced within what we feel that should be legitimately we can value it at and keep out the greed aspect. And I think that way it will be a win-win for both the investor as well as the developer. On that but note, maybe sir. It will set up for long term. On that note, sir, I'm going to wrap up because you've really said what I had wanted to conclude with. Irfan Razak, Sanjay Dutt, Sunil Rohakale with me in the Delhi studio, Amit Grover, Parry Singh and Vishal. Thanks very much, gentlemen, for joining in on this very important day. It is a big development and a game changer for the real estate uh, industry per se. High net worth retail investors, well, they definitely have a new reason to enter the capital markets through REITs now. New product. Some well-performing IPOs of REITs could make the product an instant hit, provided the landlords, as the developers of these commercial assets, be it real estate companies or even PE funds in some cases, are well-intentioned, don't take advantage, are not greedy, is something that Mr. Razak has also spelled out. If that happens, the investor is sure to run away just as he has from the stock markets. Well, we are hoping that that doesn't happen. On that note, I'm going to conclude. Thanks very much for watching.